My name is Adam Kokesh. I served as a sergeant on a Marine Corps Civil Affairs team in the Fallujah area from February to September of 2004. And I actually volunteered to go to Iraq. I was a reservist in an artillery unit. And when I found out my unit was getting called up, I decided I didn't want to miss the party. So I found out that a civil affairs group at Camp Pendleton was looking for volunteers. And so I went out of my way to volunteer for that. And I was against the war before the war, even believing all of the lies that were told by Colin Powell at the UN, believing all of the intelligence, believing all the spin, I didn't think it was going to be worth it. But I thought that afterwards what we were doing was cleaning up our mess and really responsible foreign policy and genuinely trying to do good by the Iraqi people. And that was something I wanted to be a part of and something that I enthusiastically risked my life for. This is the rules of engagement card that I was issued for our, our deployment to Iraq. And this is held up as the gold standard of conduct in the occupation right now. I'll just read a part of it. It says, nothing on this card prevents you from using deadly force to defend yourself. Enemy military and paramilitary forces may be attacked subject to the following instructions. Positive identification is required prior to engagement. Positive identification is reasonable certainty, and that's in quotes on the card, that your target is a legitimate military target. And of course, we're supposed to keep this in our, in our breast pocket here. Um, but when Marines are put in a situation where they receive fire and all they see is a muzzle flash coming from a building and they don't have positive identification but they know that if they return fire through that window or towards that building that they're, they're more likely to live through whatever's going on. It's a really difficult situation and I think it's criminal to put such patriotic Americans who have sworn a, an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America in a situation where their morals are at odds with their survival instincts. During the siege of Fallujah, we changed rules of engagement more often than we changed our underwear. At first it was, you know, you follow the rules of engagement, you do what you're supposed to do, and then there were times when it was you can shoot any suspicious observer, so someone with binoculars and a cell phone was fair game. And that really opened things up to a lot of subjectivity. But also firing at muzzle flashes into the city, firing Mark 19s into the city uh, became common practice. And at one point, we imposed a curfew on the city of Fallujah. And at that point, we were, we were told we were allowed to shoot anything after dark. And uh, fortunately, I was never put in that situation to make that decision. But there were a lot of Marines you know, on the positions around me who were forced to make those choices. About the situation being, being criminal, about the criminality of putting Marines in this position, because when you tell them that the rules of engagement are you can shoot anything that moves after dark, we have a reasonable certainty based on our intelligence or whatever that anything that moves after dark is an enemy combatant. Well, you can't expect those Marines to stop and, and analyze every situation because they're going to operate based on those rules of engagement and they're going to do what they have to do. So I was got up in the middle of the night uh, when the Iraqi policeman at our checkpoint got the call and uh, through pointing and pantomime and the little Arabic I spoke at the time and an Arabic translation dictionary, I was able to help figure out that there were Marines shooting at uh, Iraqi firefighters and cops, and we were able to send it down our chain of command and stop that from happening. Um, but you know, how many incidents like that happened where it wasn't so clear, and there were just shadows that being shot at? And I know that, you know, that that happened while I was there during the siege of Fallujah. That kind of thing, where you know, we, we're just, you know, harassing people unnecessarily, is really kind of part of daily life there. And eventually, we set up a proper checkpoint, and. Uh, the, I, I, went, I was relieved and went back inside, and the Marines that were there were checking almost every car that came through, and they found a, a couple of guys that had a bag of cash in their back seat. And they detained them on suspicion, and we're like, all right, well, we're going to detain them and interrogate them. And so they were zip cuffed and hooded. And we brought them, I brought them, I was told to go out and get them and pick them up. And so I picked them up in my Humvee, got the bag of cash, brought them back to the office where it was air conditioned, and, and sat them down, and uh, was just keeping an eye on them. And then the interrogators got there, and they were like, why the heck are you guys being so nice to these people? And they started roughing them up and throwing their heads against the wall and you know, pr preparing them for interrogation. And they, they dragged them out of the office and, and uh, apparently they got actually reprimanded on the outside of the office by, uh, by one of our officers for, um, for engaging in that unnecessary behavior. And then they interrogated them and they found out that there was no reason uh, to detain them any further. And the, the bag of cash was about this big, which would have been a lot of American money, but Iraqi 
uh, dinars, it was only about ten, fifteen thousand dollars, and so they let him go just like that. And I can tell you, if that money wasn't intended for the insurgency beforehand, it was after that. My name is Jason Hurd. I recently completed 10 years of honorable service to my country in both the U.S. Army and the Tennessee National Guard. I served in central Baghdad from November of 04 to November of 05. I'm from a little place nestled in the mountains of East Tennessee called Kingsport. My father was adamantly opposed to me serving in the military. My father was one of the most warmongering, gun-loving people you could ever meet. But he didn't feel that way when it came to his son because he knew the negative psychological consequences of combat service. Looking back, I know for a fact that my father had post-traumatic stress disorder. He had the rage, he had the nightmares, and he had the flashbacks. I decided against my father's wishes to go into the military as a medic in August of 97. We got into Iraq in November of 04, and I was there until November of 05. I served as a medic with Troop F, 2nd Squadron, 278th Regimental Combat Team. After we finished the EOD escort missions, we moved on to another mission, patrolling the Kendi Street area, which is right outside of the Green Zone. Kendi Street is a relatively upscale neighborhood. Some of the houses in the Kendi area would cost well over a million dollars here in America. Um, this area, from what we were told, had no violent activity at all up until the point we started patrolling this area. I remember we were out on a patrol one day, a dismounted patrol, and we were walking by a woman's house. She was outside in her garden doing some work. We had our interpreter with us, and our interpreter threw up his hand and said, Salam Alaikum which is their greeting in Iraq. It means peace of God be with you. And he translated back to us what she said. She said, no, no peace of God be with you. She was angry and she was frustrated. And so we stopped and our interpreter said, well, what's the matter? What's, why are you so angry? We're here uh, protecting you. We're here to ensure your safety. And that woman began to tell us a story. Just a few months prior to this, her husband had been shot and killed by a United States convoy because he got too close to their convoy. He was not an insurgent, he was not a terrorist, he was merely a working man trying to make a living for his family. A few weeks after this man died, the special forces team got some intelligence that this woman was supporting the insurgency. And so they conducted a raid on her home, zip-tied her and her two children, threw them on the floor, and I guess her son was old enough to be perceived as a possible threat, so they detained him and took him away. For the next two weeks, this woman had no idea whether her son was alive, dead, or worse. At the end of that two weeks, the special forces team rolled up, dropped her son off, and without so much as an apology, drove off. It turns out they had found they had acted on bad intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, things like that happen every day in Iraq. We are harassing these people. We are disrupting their lives. One day, we were on another dismounted patrol through the Kendi Street area. We were walking past an area we called the Garden Center because it was literally a fenced-off garden. As is policy, we were to keep all cars and individuals away from our formation. And so a car was approaching us from the front. I was at the rear of the formation because I was the medic, and the medics hang out at the back with the platoon sergeant in case anything happens up front so you can respond. They waved the car off down a side street so that it would not come near our formation. As I made it up to that side street, the car had turned around and was coming back towards us because the street was blocked off by a, a concrete T barrier at the other end. So I began doing my levels of aggression. I held up my hand, getting, trying to get the car to stop. The car sped up. And I thought to myself, oh my God, this is it. This is someone who is trying to hurt us. And so instead of doing what I should have done according to policy and raising my weapon, instead I did what you should never do and I took my hands off of my weapon altogether and began jumping up and down, waving my hands back and forth, trying to get this car to stop and see me. The car kept coming. And so I raised my weapon 
and the car kept coming. I pulled my selector switch off of safe, and the car kept coming. I was applying pressure to my trigger, getting ready to fire on the vehicle. And out of nowhere, a man came off of the side of the road, flagged the car down, and got it to pull over. He walked around to the driver's side door, opened it up, and out popped an 80-year-old woman. Come to find out, this woman was a highly respected figure in the community, and I don't have a clue what would have happened had I opened fire on this woman. I would imagine a riot. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate guns. I spent 10 years in the military, and I carried two of them on my side in Iraq. But I think they should be melted down and turned into jewelry. <laughs> to this day, that is the worst thing that I've ever done in my life. I am a peaceful person, but yet in Iraq, I drew down on an 80-year-old geriatric woman who could not see me because I was in front of a desert-colored vehicle, or excuse me, desert-colored building wearing desert-colored camouflage. Part of our mission was to meet and greet the local population and find out what their problems were. And so I approached a man with my interpreter on the side of the road, and I, I asked him, I said, look, are your lives better because we're here? Are you safer? Do you feel more secure? Do you feel like we are liberating you? And that man looked at me straight in the eye, and he said, Mr. We Iraqis know that you have good intentions here. But the fact of the matter is, before America invaded, we didn't have to worry about car bombs in our neighborhoods. We didn't have to worry about the safety of our own children as they walked to school. And we didn't have to worry about US soldiers shooting at us as we drive up and down our own streets. Ladies and gentlemen, the suffering in Iraq is tearing that country apart. And ending that suffering begins with a complete and immediate withdrawal of all of our troops. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is John Michael Turner. I current re currently reside in Burlington, Vermont. I served with Kilo Company 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines as an automatic machine gunner. There's a term, uh, once a Marine, always a Marine. But there's also the term, eat the apple, F the core. I don't work for you no more. I served three deployments with Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines, one of which was in Haiti. The other two were in Iraq, uh, in between Fallujah and Abu Ghraib the first time, and in downtown Ramadi at the government center the second time. On April 18th, 2006, I had my first confirmed kill. Uh, this man was innocent. I don't know his name. I called him the fat man. Um, he was walking back to his house, and I shot him in front of his friend and his father. The first round didn't kill him after I had hit him up here in his neck area. And afterwards, he started screaming and looked right into my eyes. So I looked at my friend who, was, who I was on post with, and I said, well, I can't let that happen. So I took another shot and took him out. He was then carried away by the rest of his family. It took seven people to carry his body away. We were all congratulated after we had our first kills, and that happened to have been mine. My, C or my company commander personally congratulated me, as he did everyone else in our company. This is the same individual who had stated that whoever gets their first kill by stabbing them to death will get a four-day pass when we return from Iraq. There's one incident where we got into a firefight just south of the government center, about 2,000 meters. We had no idea where the fire was coming from. And the way our rules of engagement were, pinpoint where the fire is coming from and throw a rocket at it. So with that being said, we still didn't know where the fire was coming from. And an 84 millimeter rocket was shot into a house. I do not know if there was anyone in it. We do not know if that's where the fire was coming from, but that's what was done. This man right here was my third confirmed kill. As you can see, he was riding his bicycle. 
this. Later on in the day, we went ahead and uh, we had CBS, Laura Logan with us, but she was with the other squad. And so she wasn't with us. So myself and two other people went ahead and took out some individuals because we were excited about the firefight we had just gotten into and we didn't have a cameraman or woman with us. With that being said, any time we did have embedded reporters with us, our actions would change drastically. We never acted the same. We were always on key with everything, play, did everything by the books. The, the man on the bicycle, he was left in the street for about 10 minutes until we realized that we needed to leave where we were. And his body was dragged about 10 feet to the right of him, where his body was thrown behind a rock wall and his bicycle was thrown on top of him. Um, on my wrist, there is Arabic for FU. I got that put on my wrist just two weeks before we went to Iraq because that was my choking hand. And anytime I felt the need to take out aggression, I would go ahead and use it. This is um, after uh, one, of, one of the guys in the uh, weapons company had gotten shot. Uh, this is a way that we would take out our aggression. unless you were taking fire from it. 